Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Camel, but more importantly, welcome back to the Elder Scrolls Detective series. A series in which we investigate, curate, speculate, hypothesize, theorize, and quite often simply highlight and discuss cool, interesting, and hidden things that can be found within the Elder Scrolls games. Now be sure to check out my other Elder Scrolls Detective videos, they're a lot of fun and I know you will enjoy them. Links to those can be found down in the description, along with links to all of my social medias, which you should also be sure to check out, of course, after this video. Because today's investigation entails the thorough rummagings and shakedowns of a conspiracy and cold case haunting Skyrim. It will be a sickening observation of one of Skyrim's purest yet dirtiest circles of life. And this gripping investigation begins in the Rift, home to vibrant autonomous forests, leaf glittered grounds and is brimming with busy bursts of life, be it flora or fauna. The Rift holds a place in many of our hearts, with its foot through the door of our affection, as it is one of Skyrim's most beloved jewels. With the Rift being such a gargantuan glimmering geode of geographical gorgeousness, Many strange and complex occurrences are birthed here, and today we'll be magnifying one of these magnificent happenings. As when venturing the woods of the Rift, which have been painted with a summer palette, we may just hear a blood freezing howl. Far off in the distance, a wolf, perhaps a pack, dare we venture closer? Oh yes, while gingerly, stealthily slithering our way through the chromatic bosks of the Rift, Peeking through the bushes, cradled lazily in the dale before us, a man-made structure can be made out. It appears to be a cage. Iron bars forged and woven into a prison, and within, a prisoner. A lone wolf, howling through the whispering woods, calling to its kin. But luckily, only we came. A poor beast that we have run into before in my CCC video for the Rift. Feel free to check it out if you like. On the ground inside the cage, we can see that this canine was lured in with a big, juicy hunk of meat, one few could resist. The wolf is actually not hostile towards us at all, so we should set it free and part on good terms. Upon doing so, the perpetrators of this imprisonment will reveal themselves from behind a boulder, and the wolf will have something to say about it. Now you can actually save the wolf and go your separate ways, but in this instance, sadly, the wolf was slain. However, rest assured justice was dealt this day as I struck down the trappers. Odd. A pair of woodsmen trapping the local wildlife. Maybe it's for the hide. Wolves don't make good eating, so leather harvesting is more likely. Or maybe they wanted this one alive. As it is strange that they sat behind the rock, waiting, while they had already caught the wolf. We should head to the Rift's capital city, Riften, and see if the local guards can lend us leads. Give us a scent to track. And hopefully, we're not barking up the wrong tree. Good day. Can you tell me, have you had any bandits or trappers knocking around these parts recently? I mostly deal with petty thievery and drunken brawls. Been too long since we've had a good bandit raid. Ah, and when was the last time there was a good bandit raid? City got attacked once by those damn bandits. Come east across the lake from Faldar's Tooth. I won't be trying that again. Faldar's Tooth? From the east across the lake. Well, Faldar's tooth is west across the lake, although I suppose the bandits from which came east across the lake to attack Riften. So the guard lies not. We should definitely investigate Faldar's tooth. It's a rather large and rather ruined fortress, sitting crooked and slightly sunken on the shores of Lake Honric. Down by the water, there is a dock and a small boat. Perhaps this Faldar's Tooth is frequented by visitors, enough so that they have specifically built a pier to house and host the coming boats. Well, we should approach the fortress and see if anyone can help us on our quest. There is a man on guard up on the wooden parapet outshoots. Once was a woman as fair as an evening of springtime in old Ross Mackay. He seems like a jolly fellow singing away into the wind. He might just be able to aid our cause. Good day, sir. Give him the dogs, boys. 
Oh damn, he's not our friend at all. How dare he setting dogs on us and bad AI dogs at that. So it seems this group of bandits are using these wolves as guard dogs, using them to their advantage. Well, we'll make quick work of these fools and their furry friends. There is a tower here at Faldar's Tooth, ironically towering above the rest of the fort. This is home to the bandit chief who is the brains behind this entire operation. As we approach, he will say this. So you're the one who's been down there killing all my wolves. You're gonna die for that. He is not too pleased, but little does he know that we have an arsenal of WWE moves. Once he's dealt with, we are free to inspect the local area. On this table, next to where the bandit chief stood, the lock picking skill book, proper lock design and construction can be found. Along with this, on the bookshelf next to the leader's bed, there is the alteration skill book, the Lunar Lorcan, both of which are free to take for those who wish to obtain them and their knowledge. But this location seems far too big for these surface bandits to be the entire story here. We'll need to venture deeper into the fortress of Faldar's Tooth. There are two entrances into Faldar's Tooth. Take either one. They will eventually lead to the same path anyway. So in we go. Straight away, we will be met by two cages. Wolves, perhaps? It doesn't look like it, as there is a bedroll in here suggesting that a humanoid sleeps here. Prisoners, maybe. Regardless, it is unoccupied at this time. Now around the stony corner, a large room will be found housing two stretching racks, although one has been made to serve as a shelf for storing boxes. This leads me to think that the stretching racks in question don't really seem to be used that much for their intended purposes anyway. Although across from this, there is a fully functioning stretching rack. So perhaps, like any standard household, people are tortured here from time to time. Exiting this room will be met by a booby-trapped staircase. Strangely, the trip wire is at the bottom of the staircase, presumably preventing people leaving Faldar's Tooth via this very staircase, opposed to stopping people from coming in this way. Now at the base of the trap stairs, we have two options, left or right. For now, we'll go to the right, pull the lever and head on through into the unknown halls ahead. Around this next cobbled corner, we'll find some life. A bandit standing guard over this lone wolf locked in a cage. Finally, some signs of man's best friend. It does seem to be well looked after with a trough of drinking water and a bucket full of meat for it to feast upon. Seems that you want the wolf alive, perhaps to be used to the bandit's advantage. After all, meat is a costly substance, so keeping such a beast could be expensive. On the other side of the room is a staircase that leads up to the other entrance into Faldar's Tooth, the one that we didn't take in. So we now know where both entrances lead to, so let's head deeper into the tunnels of this moss-clad maze. Now there is actually a hallway offshooting this room, which for now we will skip, but we'll come back to it, I assure you. So let's head through the door that we skipped earlier on at the base of the stairs. As we approach the ascent up the stairs, we may hear some faint tinkering. Soon we'll spot the source of such a sound. A bandit working away in the workshop, as one does, with the deep red glow of the forge and the virgin golden sparks of the grindstone spitting away at the air. For reasons, unbeknownst to me, there is a bucket burning alive in the coals of the forge. It's enough to make one pale. On the shelves, unrefined ore can be found, meaning the weapons and armor are not only upkept here, but also made here. There is also a shelf in front of the grinding bandit showcasing some of his most recent works. On the other side of the workshop, we can actually find stairs that lead below. And as we make our way down, we'll be met by buckets and plenty of them. This room seems to have fallen victim to flooding, although it can't be too recent, as there is a fairly sturdy and well-built walkway in place for travelers to make their way across undampened. And despite there being a lake right outside this fort, and despite us being far underground, I do believe that the water came in through the roof, as there are a number of buckets and baskets in here suggesting that they were trying to catch water leaking in from the ceiling. Although we can't be sure, this could just be some kind of washroom. They also seem to know that they have somewhat of a rodent problem, as there are traps set up and also a skeever to step right into these traps, although it hasn't at this point. 
There is also a trip wire and a swinging mammoth's skull found at the fire exit, warning people from using this passage as an escape. In the water, we can also find a coin purse. Perhaps gold flows through Faldar's tooth. Anyway, onwards we must push. Exiting this drowned room, we'll pass a mushroom covered corner into another hallway with a bandit standing guard. Ugh, he looks like he can smell something foul. And he can. What we have here is actually a set of stalls or toilets. Not ones that I'd want to use, but uh, when you gotta go, you gotta go. As we can see, they sit on the stool and then uh, shoot their business into buckets and bowls. There is a cupboard here with a spare bowl slash toilet and a potion of health, magicka and stamina. Another shelf has two more toilets slash buckets slash cauldrons however you wish to label them. There's also some reading material for those, you know, long hauls. There's also a bottle of skooma for that extra push and a bottle of resist fire to help one mitigate that ring sting. Next to each of the stalls, there are more books to accompany the brave souls using these toilets. There is also a potion of stamina to help you endure the strains of expulsion. And finally, there is also a potion of the warrior to guarantee in times of need, you can conquer that number two. Making our move away from the stench and around the next corner, a lone sloped hallway will be presented. Midway on the right side is a storage cupboard, which has been booby trapped with a pressure plate and a swinging wall of spikes. What on Tamriel is so worth protecting? Ah, I see, it's the mead storage a valuable substance close to all of our hearts. Now along with the mead, we can find a potion of stamina, magicka and health, the combination of which seems to be a common theme throughout this dungeon. Moving on through to the next room, there is another room shooting off to the left. This would, pun intended, appear to be a wood storage room, as we can see a stack of firewood and a woodcutter's axe resting on one side of the room. On the other side, there is a bow on the floor above which is a table adorned with various items including the archery skill book, the marksmanship lesson. And up against the other wall is a chest, but be careful as it is booby trapped. Now back out into the main room, there is a mammoth's skull hanging as a decoration, accompanied by a mounted wolf's head across from it. Maybe, just maybe, this is what they're using the wolves for, to be turned into household decorations. I do hope not. Now around the corner there are two bandits a bunch of shelves and a table covered in tankards and gold coins. It would appear that some betting was going on here as the coins seem to be stacked up into little stacks. Betting on what though? Hard to say as this place is a strange one indeed. Anyway, time to make our way through the next door. As we open up to the left is a caved in staircase. Tucked away and hidden behind a pillar is a potion of light feet, out of sight and ironically being a sneaky potion. Now out to the right, we have what I could only describe as a dormitory, a curved hallway lined with beds, many beds. Presumably there are many bandits that call this fort home, or maybe there are many visitors that come through here. There are, of course, various items of uninterest littered across an array of shelves and tables. Funnily, the one bandit who is actually sleeping here has chosen to take rest on the only bedroll on the floor instead of using one of the many free and much comfier beds. Progressing further and just feet before the termination of this curvaceous bedchamber, to the left is a doorway which leads to the fortress's mess hall. A spacious circular dining hall with plenty of tables and chairs, wine bottles scattered across the floor, butcheries worth of tender meat, on the tables ready to be eaten by the masses of in Faldar's tooth. Ah, uh, come on, maybe this place ain't so bad after all. Oh, and I think I found the leak. I found all the leaks. Up against the door, we can find a whole stack of grilled leeks that have presumably been thrown up against the door as the bowls and plates are scattered across the ground as well. Well, it would seem that the bandits really didn't want to eat their vegetables, although the meat they're happy with. Ah, classic bandits. So, now we're going to go back to the hallway we skipped way back at the start of the dungeon next to the room with the wolf in the cage. 
As we make our way through, we'll see more signs of flooding and get a stench of wet dog. As out into the next room, we have what can only be described as kennels. Wolves in cages, plenty of them too. Sadly, there is a dead dog in one of the cages. Given there is no blood around it, I would say it died of natural causes, although there is food and water in here. Maybe it wouldn't eat the food and just died of starvation, maybe it died of sadness. But we cannot tarry on the dead, for we are the living and must push on. On this broken pillar there is an axe, although its use is unknown, presumably to deal with any dogs that get out of hand. We will also find several empty cages, leading to the thought that wolves and dogs tend to come and go in this place. At the far end of the room is a wolf cage with a mound of hay next to it. Eerily, this has a selection of human bones in it. So maybe these caged up dogs and wolves have been fed human remains? Again, meat is a costly substance, so you know, make use of what you got I suppose. But it's not a good idea to give your captive animals a taste for human flesh. Across from this are three shelves, decorated with a variety of armor, weapons, skulls, meat hooks and wolf skins. Perhaps people fight these wolves and that's what the armor is for and where the skulls have come from. Any deceased wolves appear to have been harvested and turned into wolf skins, presumably to be used for leather. There is also a master level locked door. Ooh, what could be behind it? Mew. That's as disappointing as insert something that would offend you and then pretend I said it. Yeah, that's right. I said it. We got some salt, spider eggs, canis root and an apothecary satchel. Truly not worth locking up, seems we've been trolled. Now down through the rest of the room we can find two tables side by side and a whole lot of blood. A wolf on the tables, two soul gems, a dagger, a stack of books and a bandit looking at the whole thing as confused as we are. Did this guy kill the wolf? Is he trying some necromancy on the wolf corpse, hence the soul gems? It's actually really quite hard to say what's happening here. Although there is a tanning rack in the corner, so maybe this wolf is being harvested for its skin. But is this all this is? A leather production? Surely simply hunting wolves would be easier instead of bringing them back here to be housed, fed and watered. Curious, but we must press on. Tucked away behind these two tables is yet another pressure plate, which will activate a swinging spiked wall, obliterating any who don't tread carefully. Behind it is a chest with random loot. Now across from the two tables is a door which has been somewhat covered up by these baskets. The door will be locked, but can be opened. Inside is yet another cupboard styled storage room with a shelf boasting many potions, draft files and magical elixirs, above which is another wall mounted wolf's head. Still, this whole schmozzle doesn't tell us much. We should push on through to the light, venturing further into the dungeon and down the hallway, we'll actually spot a trail of gold leading on. And like the bewildered children that we are, we'll follow it while we bear the mask of Hansel and Gretel. This gold will lead to a conversation. I'll do you 10 gold at three to one on the white one. Sounds like easy money to me. You're on. Get him! Rip his throat out! Ah, a pit. A fighting pit within which pit wolves. Ah, oh, so thusly do the planets align. Although, heed my words, there are more planets to join the astral alignment of realization, believe ye me. It's all so clear now, housing wolves and dogs to be pitted against each other in a fight to the death. With vagabonds, blackguards, swindlers, betters, bandits and all walk of rough folk congregated to feast and sate their savage appetites on blood sports and maybe in just another way trust me those planets are coming while right now there are only three watching the current match there are many seats lining the outer perimeter of the fighting cage with it being able to clearly host tens of viewers if not more a lucrative little illegal plot we see unfolding before our very eyes not only are there clear signs of betting and money exchange but there is even a betel's cashier cage where bettles can officially place their bets and have their winnings or losses given or taken. As we can see, quite a few people 
have lost, as there is a small treasury's worth of valuables locked back here. And if any betters aren't pleased with their losses and kick up a stink, well, they might just end up like this poor bloke. A dark elf, locked in a cage, dead. It would appear he was fed and watered, although it would seem he did not have a taste for leeks, such as every other plonker in this place. So the beasts are forced to fight to the death. Then what? Well, surely the wolves' remains are taken back to the skinning rack and turned into leather, right? Look at the blood. Blood in the ring, as to be expected. But where is the blood outside the ring? It leads up the stairs and to this locked doorway. Where does this lead then if not to the tanning rack? It leads down a dim and damp hallway, descending down into cool and still black waters. Down here, floating, we can find several wolf corpses. Perhaps their hides are too damaged after the fights to be salvaged. So instead of being skinned, they are dumped in the flooded sewers of Faldar's tooth, left to rot and bloat. Blah. More likely, they are left for the skeevers to clean up, as we can find a few of those pesky little buggers scuttling around down here. Death by arena dumped only to be eaten by Skaven. What a waste of a beautiful beast. Up these stairs, there is another wolf corpse lying on some wood with an axe firmly wedged into its ribs? Call me an overly suspicious detective, but something tells me Skeevers didn't do this. Maybe the wolf got in the way of someone cutting firewood back here. Or maybe it was still kicking a bit and, you know, it was put out of its pain. Well, we can confirm that the wolf was axed. Now, there is actually a locked gateway blocking our path further. However, if we set our gaze high, we will notice that there is actually another level above the tunnel from which we entered the sunken room. Up here, there are several barrels, skeevers, and other knickknacks. More importantly though, and clearly illuminated by the light's divine flicker, a single candle sits in the middle atop a small post. Here we can find the switch which must be fondled and flicked like so many of us, opening its gate and allowing us to enter further, penetrating the private passageways of a half-drowned crypt, pushing through further into the soul of Faldar's tooth through these collapsed and dilapidated hallways. At the end of which, before we turn, we can find a sleeping roll, suggesting that someone sleeps back here, in this dank and dingy passageway. When we turn the corner, signs of life, light, and items of interest can be spotted. A shelf filled with various clothing and apparel. A pile of wood cut and ready for the raging fire not far from here. In the next room, there is what appears to be a kitchen, with one Cook, a lovely, skull-faced lady slaving away in the kitchen of Faldar's tooth, cooking up meals and feasts for the battles and blackguards to chow down on. Luckily though, this kitchen is well stocked. There's plenty of herbs, garlic, leeks, and meat, everything a chef could need to feed the masses. In this kitchen, on one of the bottom shelves, we can also find some incredibly rare, wieldable knife and fork weapons. I do have a guide for all of them if you do wish to check it out, but not before seeing this investigation through. On the bench, next to the chef, there is a book called Uncommon Tastes. In this, the author tells of their most famous dish and will not reveal the secret ingredient, instead informing the reader that their imagination and creativity is the secret ingredient. I do wonder how such empowering yet vague philosophies have directed this chef to craft their cooked goods. Well, on the table and back, along with some gloves and gold, we can find the cook's journal. Maybe this will give us the gastronomical insight we search for. Meat, 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 that's all they ever want. I made them some nice grilled leeks and they threw them in my face. I told them that if they'd bring me some fish or venison, I'd cook it up. But all they ever do is waste their wages at the ring. God, uh, hmm. But maybe, maybe there is a way I can get them some meat. <laughs> oh dear, I mean, oh dog. Wolf, wolf, nudge, nudge. Meat, what kind of meat? Ladies and gentlemen, this is dog meat, your favorite companion, butchered 
sliced, served up ready to be consumed. Caution though, it may contain fleas. So, the dogs and wolves, the poor pups being kept and slain here are secretly being fed back to the bandits running the place. That's why out in the feast hall, there is meat everywhere. Almost excesses of meat. Everything in here is being fed dog meat. Even the wolves and dogs are being fed dog meat. Maybe that's why this dog starved to death in its cage. Despite it having food, it refused to consume the flesh of its brethren. The cook also mentions that when she cooked some nice grilled leeks, they threw them back at her. This explains why there is a pile of plates and leeks scattered all over the ground up against the door of the kitchen. Well, they wanted meat and they got meat, dog meat, in every meal they've been eating. Oh boy. Let's do a quick recap here. They catch the dogs and wolves, bring them back to Faldar's tooth, cage them and feed them their family and occasionally human. They are then set up against each other for the entertainment and profits in the fighting pit. The lacerated and mangled bodies of the fallen are dragged and dumped in the flooded cellars of the fortress left to the carrion. Then, secretly, the cook uses a seldomly frequented secret passageway to haul the wolf carcasses from the cellar through the dark vestibule of vengeance, the stone pathway taking the dogs into the next life, to be carved, chopped, sliced, portioned, cooked and served, only to have their flesh chewed upon and a marrow sucked by the very man who set them to death in the first place. Well. Waste not, want not, I suppose. But would you be happy with this? Would you be happy unknowingly chowing down on dogs? I think not. So next time you see a poster for a missing dog in Riften, you might just know what happened to it. Next time you see a wolf being hunted in the wilds or fighting other beasts, know that there are worse fates. And next time you dine at Faldar's Tooth, be sure to order the leeks and not the hot dogs. So I do hope that you've enjoyed the discovery and the dark circle of life that can be found in practice at Faldar's Tooth, unbeknownst to everyone but the cook. Capturing beasts, feeding them other humans, pitting them against each other and then right under their noses, being fed the very flesh of the beasts that they bet on. Now be sure to let me know and others how you feel about this, feasting on dogs, wolves and canines alike. Is this sick or is this a good use of otherwise wasted meat? If you have any information, facts, evidence, speculation, theories, or anything to do with Thalda's Tooth, be sure to comment below. If you do have any ideas for something that you think should be covered in an Elder Scrolls Detective series video, be sure to let me know. I'll look into whatever strange and wonderful topics you present. And if you did enjoy this video, please do me a kindness and leave a like. Leave a comment with your Elder Scrolls Detective video ideas and thoughts on the hot dog circle at Thalda's Tooth. And of course, if you did enjoy this video and you wish to see more videos similar to this one, please subscribe. It helps me know that people enjoy these kind of videos and will result in more of them. Be sure to click the little bell icon next to the subscribe button right here on YouTube so that you are notified when new Elder Scrolls Detective videos are uploaded. Other Elder Scrolls Detective video links can be found in the description. Down there is also a link to my social medias. So be sure to follow me on Twitter and if you'd like to support the channel in a more personal way, you can become a heroic patron on Patreon. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So feel free to check out the playlist on screen. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.